I've been set free I've been redeemed by I think a lot of us go around and we hear a lot of Christian, and I'll put that almost in quotes, Christian stuff, uh, whether it's on, maybe it's music on 88.1 and we're listening to different things with the label Christian on it, maybe sometimes it's Moody Radio, Talk Radio, um, which Moody has on there, 570, which is uh, an AM station that has a lot of preaching on it. Uh, there's a myriad of Bible studies, men's groups, women's groups, people in different churches doing round tables. There's a lot of banter here and there about Christian things, and I think about the Bible in general. It, it seems as if it's everywhere, and yet we're almost overwhelmed with it. One of the things that we miss in that is not only what we're hearing, but how we're hearing that. We need to know how to hear the Word of God. And I think a lot of us have missed that. One of the, one of the verses that, that makes that really clear is in Luke 18, uh, Luke 8, 18, where Jesus said to be careful not in what you hear, but how you hear. So as, as Kenny prayed, I think a lot of us have this, this mindset. It goes back to the... The see no evil, hear no evil, do no evil type of thing. Can a, they have an updated picture of this, which is which is um, more with the uh, iPod in the air, which is kind of where we're at today. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. But I want us to just stop for a moment. And how are we going to hear this sermon today? Because you can hear what I have to say. You can listen to the stuff on the radio or on... TV and listen to what David Jeremiah and Charles Stanley and all of these people on TV, but how are you hearing that? The, the way that we are to hear is to listen to what the speaker says, hear what he has to say, but then to take that and digest that with the Holy Spirit. Ask God to make it real to us. If we miss that second part, we're on like a hamster wheel, just hearing more and more Christian things. It almost becomes like an addict. I've got to get to another Bible study. I've got to watch another channel. I'm driving in the car. I've got to get the radio on. Instead of just turning off, being still, and waiting before God, saying, you know, I, had, I went to this Bible study today, God, but I didn't get a lot out of it. What do you have for me in there? What do you need to speak to me about? Holy Spirit, come and reveal Jesus to me and in me. Because that's his job, is, is to reveal Jesus. And I think we have the mindset that we can know truth without the Holy Spirit bringing it to us. And all you can do is know about it. It doesn't become true to you until the Holy Spirit makes it true to you. It was uh, Suhad, I think, that said one word from the Holy Spirit is more powerful than all of the encyclopedias in the world. And, and that's true. I've, I've sat in Bible studies... Uh, that I've been to and, and were asked to go to, and I've given soliloquies on why they're doing this verse and how what this verse means. And then I've sat there and didn't, and I've said, Holy Spirit, I'm not going to speak to you. Ask me to speak. And I'll say one word a lot of times, and that's more powerful than all of the other things that I had to say. So today, as we look at this uh, at this Romans 12:1 and 2, I want it to make it perfectly clear that I am not your teacher. Your true teacher is the Holy Spirit. And what was so cool is a couple of people praying beforehand had mentioned that. <laughs> so it's like, I didn't even need to do this opening part. But that's what's so cool, is now we're coming more and more to experience the hearing of the voice. Hear, yes, of course, hear me today, but listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to each and every one of you. And then go speak to the Holy Spirit. See, prayer is not a monologue. And we have that mindset. Well, I've got to get my prayer in today. Uh, prayer is a dialogue. We get to pray and then listen to God. If we miss that second part of the dialogue, we're missing prayer and we become just like the pagans do, as they say, with our banter over and over and over again, thinking of our many words that, the, that God will finally hear us at one point. No, prayer is a dialogue. There's a time for you to speak and there's a time to wait and to listen to God to speak. So anyways, that's my thought as we look at this verse today. Just this one verse in Romans 12.1. I don't think we're going to get to 12.2 today. But we're going to look at Romans 12.1. And then I want to pick up 
either next week or the week after that on Romans 12 too, because Romans 12 too just blows me away. And one of the things is we, we quote these verses a lot. If we don't quote it directly, we, we have that mindset of quoting it as we're talking to people. So let's just look at this verse 1. In, uh, or we'll look at both the verses, but then we're going to focus on uh, just verse 1 today. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So he starts this thing off with, I appeal to you, therefore. Um, The King James would say, I beseech you, therefore. Now, anytime there's a therefore, we must know why it is therefore. Think of it this way, uh, just to illustrate it. If I was to say to you, therefore, Jack Dawson forcibly grabbed Rose's hand and were in search of a way out of the chasms of hallways as they filled with water. Well, you'd want to know why, what was happening on that. Okay, that's a little thing for the movie Titanic, right? How about this one? Therefore, Jean Valjean decided to hide his true identity when sending the great and gracious gifts to the church that believed in him. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why did he want to hide his identity? See, if you don't understand what the therefore is there for, then you're going to start trying to figure it out or you're going to make this up. Well, he must have needed to do that because of this. Or he had to do that because of this. Instead of understanding why it's there for. Now, when we hear that word, I appeal to you or I beseech you, Many times it's come across, if not in word, but almost in demeanor from the pulpit as, I beseech you brothers, or I appeal to you brothers. Now this word is a really neat word. It's um, the word parakaleo. And it means to call to one side, to comfort, to exhort, to desire. Now did you, when you first heard that verse, is that what you thought that Paul is saying, Hey, I'm calling you to my side. I'm comforting you. I'm exhorting you. I'm desiring you to know this. Or was it this way? See, because a lot of it is this way. I beseech you, now you go out and do what God has said. And if we come with that paradigm, the words that come after that verse, it's going to taint them. It's going to color them. It's going to not make them what Paul is trying to say. This word parakaleo is is a, a pretty close word to what you get parakletos. Right? Do you guys know what the word parakletos is? It is, I'll just put it up here for you, it is our advocate. When he's talking about Jesus, that we have an advocate. If, if a brother does sin, we, if we do sin, we have an advocate. Right? There also is mentioned four different times in John 14 uh, and 15 and 16. And Jesus is calling the Holy Spirit the parakletos. So this word that he's saying is picking up on that same thing. The paracletus in, that, in those verses is the comforter. So Paul's saying, I'm comforting you. I'm not appealing to you. I'm calling you to my side. Let's, let, let me show you what this means. And, and it's almost like the enthusiasm over the last 11, uh, verse, or last 11 chapters or over this letter. He finally says, now let me call you to my side. Because there's a transition that happens in this epistle. And almost every one of Paul's epistles happen the same way. First, they build who you are. Build who you are. Build who you are. So for 11 chapters, he's building the reality of who God is, who you are, and who you now are in Christ because of the finished work of the Christ. Now, if you miss that in the therefore, then you're missing the whole idea of why he's putting the therefore, therefore. We have to know that part. What happens a lot of times is we go to what it looks like to live out this new creation prior to knowing that we are a new creation. And then we try to live it out by our own power and we get this this ugly stench of sanctified flesh instead of a new creation that's an aroma. Where we just try to make our flesh look good in front of others instead of this new aroma of what this new creature looks like. So Paul is so ramped up. And he, he gets ramped up in other places too. Ephesians is the same way. The first two and a half verses in Ephesians, I'm sorry, the first two and a half chapters in Ephesians, he's so ramped up before he starts to teach about what it means to put off the old self and to put on the new self, he falls on his knees and starts praying in Ephesians 3. And he said, oh, that you would only know the power of God in you, the power of Christ in you. That's his prayer as there's this transition. You see these transitions happening. Now, if we get the cart before the horse, it doesn't work. We must have the horse pulling the car. We must know the direction. 
So that's the there, therefore that he's talking about. So what is he thereforeing? Well, I'll just give you a quick overview of the chapters. And this is the DMG overview. It's not conclusive. It's probably not even concise in a lot of ways. But this is as I said, all right, let me, how, I, how would I sum up if somebody says, well, why did Paul put that therefore, therefore? I'd say, oh, in, in, in chapter 1, he's talking about how all of creation knows of this God and how God has reached out to all. And not only God is not only reaching out to all, but he's specifically to and for the Gentiles. He's specifically to and for the Jews. That's two and three. And guess what? It's not of your works. It's not of all the things that you think you have to do to get to God. It's of faith. And I, he gives this great example of Abraham. That was even prior to the law. And in chapter 5, he talks about Jesus' finished work has brought us into the presence of the Father. That we are now completely justified before our Father because of Jesus' finished work. And in verse 6, he says not only Jesus' finished work allows us to come before the Father, Jesus' finished work in you has made you like Jesus. And in chapter 7 it says, all other ways except faith will lead to failure and frustration. You can try it. You can try all the other ways. They'll lead to failure and frustration. But thanks be to God in chapter 8 that He doesn't condemn us, but gives us His Spirit and will never relent at finishing His good work in us. And there's nothing that can separate us from that love. And in chapters 9 through 11 that God in that has consigned all to disobedience so that He can have mercy on all. That's the sum up of, of chapter 11. We get into those chapters and we start to get fuzzy about this whole predestination thing. Just look at that last, second to, or third to last verse. God has consigned all the disobedience so that he can have mercy on all, so that all who will hear his voice receive him, and that by him will be conformed into the image of his Son and be the firstborn among many brethren. Because of all of that, therefore, I come beside you. Let me hold you by your shoulders. Now, I just showed you all this beautiful uh, 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 picture of who you are in Christ. Now let me show you what it looks like to live it out. So it's not me saying, you need to go do these things to be a better Christian. It's me saying, let me show you what it's like. I'm calling you to my side. Think about the prodigal son. Not the prodigal son that we tend to think about, the one that went out into the far country, but the prodigal son's brother who wouldn't come into the party. It says the father entreated him, called him to his side, came to his side so that he would come into the party, so that he would come into the fullness of what the father had. It was already his. He just didn't know it. He said, oh, you didn't even give me these things. Dad, you wouldn't even give me a kid. You wouldn't even give me a small offering. And the father says, no, it's already been yours. Now I entreat you, let's go into the party. Let's go in. The same, it's that same picture that Paul is giving us. It's the same picture as, as elders or shepherds within the church. We're not coming and saying, you must be like this. Yet I think a lot of times that's what's heard from the pulpit. Maybe not this pulpit because I mess up so much. But from other pulpits I think you hear that. You need to be like this. No, the shepherds, and I like how, how one brother says it, the shepherds smell like the sheep because they're in the sheep pen with them. They're lifting them out of the mud. They're, they're in there. They need one another. They're lifting each other up. There's no hierarchy. If there was any hierarchy within the church, it would be the shepherds placing themselves under the other sheep. Because that's what Christ said, or that's what Paul says in uh, Galatians 4.19. He says, I come under you until Christ be formed in you. And I like a woman giving childbirth, that's my labor, so to speak, until Christ is formed in you. It almost looks like a timeout, but it's not. All right, so let's go to the next part of that verse. I appeal to you, therefore, so I come alongside you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Now, by really is the word dia in the Greek, and it really means through. So, through the mercies of God. I'm coming to you through the mercies of God. Okay, this is, this is how I come to you guys, through the mercies of God. Now this word is, is funny too, it's this mercies is not in the act of mercy. It's not as if he's saying, well because God has acted merciful towards us, that's why I'm coming towards you. Which is true, God has acted merciful, but that's not what that word means. That's a whole different word. This word is only used in a few places, and it means not the act of mercy, but the very nature, character, and heart is a God that has that at his nature, which is merciful. So if God was only to act merciful, then what if he decided not to act that way? 
See, that's why this word in mercy is so much more powerful because it's saying out of his very depth of character and nature he is this. He cannot help but act according to his nature. So much better than God just being merciful. I mean, that's good enough. I'm, I'm thankful for God's mercy, but this is out of his, 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 his very nature of being a God that cannot help but be merciful because he acts as he is. See, so many times this word mercy, I think, becomes Christianized. And we, we, we just glance over these words like grace and saved and, and salvation and, and, and mercy. And there's so many words that we just glance over. Oh yeah, God's a merciful God. Amen. Thank you very much. But we, when you really dig into it, what that word means and how it comes to you, there's a different mindset about it. So when I say the word mercy... It's not talking about the ends of which it comes. The end of mercy, of course, is not getting what you deserve. And a lot of times we'll use that, um, we use the, uh, the police officer pulling somebody over, right? And somebody was going 100 miles an hour in, in, a, uh, in a school zone and the police officer pulled them over and said, all right, well, I'm going to give you mercy and not give you a ticket. You're not getting what you deserve. And then we put that as the face of God. Well, you know, look, God's merciful. And it's almost like, well, God just overlooks those things because out of his very nature he's merciful. He just really doesn't care about those things. But see, that's the, when you're describing that by the ends instead of what is the means. What is the means that you as a human being are receptive to getting God's mercy? Do you ever think about that? How does it come to you? What does that mean in your life? Is it just this Christianized word? Or is it more? The word actually means God's tender, loving kindness and compassion to the afflicted. That's it. So in our affliction, whether it is self-given or whether we're being afflicted by others, because remember, sin is both ways. Not only do we sin, we also, the sin of others collapses upon us. So, so many times we're so instructed to deal with the sin that we do, but we're never instructed to deal with the sin that others have has done against us. And we really need to look at that at one point. But they're both needing mercy. And it's God's tender loving kindness and compassion. So you have somebody that has sinned against you in a, in a very vicious and vile way. Well, what is God like to you? How does His mercy connect with you? Well, you're not getting what you deserve. No, no, no. How does that? God at that point is tender. He's loving. He's kind. He's compassionate to your affliction. He's the God that you can go under the wing of and say, God, I can't take it. I need, the, I need your tender, loving kindness. When you don't know that that's the nature of God, when you don't know that that's what He has for you, then it just becomes, well, I, I, I guess, well, God's not giving me what I think. Our whole plan becomes, well, I've got to teach other people that, that God's not willing to give them a ticket for going 100 miles per hour. In fact, God wants to give them $500 because they speeded through the, the kid zone, which is a lot of times how we define grace. And God becomes illogical. He almost is like this, this pansy idiot up there that is saying, Oh, please come to me. I'll, I won't give you a ticket. I'll do these things. No, God's not that way. He is completely both just and the justifier. And in His mercy, it pours out upon us when we're ready to receive that mercy. And he never push Himself upon us. But when we're ready to receive it, and that usually won't come to at the, end, at the end of our own resources, unfortunately. When we've tried to deal with the sin against us, or we've tried to deal with our own sin, and we, then we finally say, I just can't deal with it anymore, God, then our heart becomes open. Our, our, even our own uh, body language is almost like, okay, God, I can't deal with this. Now you have to deal with it. And in that, we become receptive. Our hands become open to say, okay, God, pour your mercy inside me. Pour your tender, loving kindness, and we get to know God in an experiential way not just in a knowing about that's where that knowing connects to the heart and we get to now experience the flood of divine love of divine compassion of divine mercy coming into our heart lamentations remind us that God's mercy is new every morning because he is a faithful because of his nature he is merciful and much more powerful than just giving mercy it's out of his very nature. He can't help but be who he is. I love how Psalms 103 says, As a father pities his child, the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our form, he remembers that we are dust. How many times have I prayed that, God, I've messed up again. I, I, I need your mercy, and or I need your pity. I mean, 
I'm harder on myself, I think, a lot of times than God is harder on me. Because I think, oh, I've got it now. i got it, and I'm going to run out and go do it for you, God. God says, go ahead, go do it for me. And I fail, and I say, why, God? Because it was never meant to be that way. You're meant to do from me, not for me. When I do from you, of course I'm doing for him. But it becomes his power working inside me. Then mercy, as it floods into my heart, as, as my hands become receptive to understand this, out of that I'm able to give that same tender love and kindness and compassion for others that are afflicted. I don't want it originating from me anyway. It would just be tainted. I have to be that vessel of mercy, not just somebody that... Now you go out there and, and give mercy. Well, my mercy is never like God's mercy but unless I allow his mercy to flow through me. So I come alongside you, is what he first talked about, out of his incredible finished work and character that you might... It, it's, it's one thing to say because of. It's another thing that says through that. Well, because of God, I can now come alongside you. It's through that I come to you. It's through the mercy. It's through the manifold person of Christ living in me, being united together, that I can come to you. And now we can start to look at who he has created us to be. That's why this first verse in this chapter is, is transitioning into living out what this grace looks like, and living out what this new creation looks like. It's so important because if we don't see it the correct way, we get right back under that quid pro quo. We get right back under that, well, you've got to now do this. Instead of the motivation coming from, because he's made me this way, I get to be this. Got to and get to are two totally different things. I saw this little movie clip a number of ways, a number of years ago, but I thought it just fit, fit, fit the description here. I don't know why, and you guys can maybe yell at me later for this, but I just thought it was kind of funny and it fit the description. Oh, oh, i got to go back here. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, in a relationship, isn't that true? <laughs> and, and, and it's night and day, isn't it? I mean, fine, I'll go do the dishes. No, no, no. And so I think that that's our mindset a lot of times, is God saying up there, come on, you go do this. Oh, fine, I'll go do it. No, it, he wants us to want to, and the only way we will want to is when his very character and nature lives inside us. We recognize that as who we now are, and we begin to say, okay, God, if this is who you say I am, then I will go and live out of this. There's the presenting yourself. You, you've said this is who I am. I don't, don't, may not feel like this. I may not think that even this is who I am. But I'm going to trust you over my own thoughts, over my own feelings, and I'm going to learn to walk in what you say is reality, not what I believe is reality, because I've been deceived too many times. Think about how many times you guys have been deceived in your life. I mean, for me... It was always the newest, best thing. It was like, all right, no, it's self-help. No, now it's the secret. Now it's these different things of, of this has got to be the answer. And I've been deceived so many times. I mean, TV is full of, what, what do they call those uh, ads that are long? Infomercials. I mean, I swear if I just took this protein powder in one week, I would look like, you know, I would lose 38 pounds and I would uh, have a six-pack. Wow, I'm going to call that number. Well, I mean, how many I'm not going to have anybody raise their hands, but I'm sure all of us have either bought something off of an infomercial or we bought something that was deceptive. So what God is calling out to us to, today is to say, don't buy into the deception. You guys are fallible. Look, you're made of dust. I pity you. I pity you with a love and compassion that you guys can know for real. Now, trust me. Let me show you what is real. Live out of what is real. He goes on to say, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. See, sometimes when we read this, I think it would read it this way. I have to make myself holy and acceptable and present myself to God or, or else, right? Because that's what he's saying there. All right, I've got to make my body holy and acceptable and present myself to God. That's not what that means. That's not what that says at all. It says because, and I'm going to show you this, 
hopefully not getting too too much into some of the Greek in here, but because I am holy and acceptable. See, if you didn't have that therefore, you would think, oh, my holiness and acceptability is something that is uh, is hinging upon me. Because I am holy and acceptable, I'm able to respond, my response to his ability, and present myself wholly to him as a living manifestation of Jesus in the world. If you don't know his finished work, then you are thinking or you have this mindset, this trajectory where um, God started the work in me, there's justification, and my sanctification is all about me, and you start taking that out and you get farther and farther away from the truth. But then you're, you're confronted with so many verses that don't say that. It tells you to go live out who you are, that's, that's for sure. And in fact, in this one, he's going to talk about what it looks like to live that out. But the, but the process of becoming like Jesus, or the process of putting on all that is ours, is not up to us anyway. Look at what he says in Philippians 1.6. He says, I'm sure of this, that he who began the good work in you, you get to complete that at the day of Jesus Christ. No. And that's our mindset a lot of times. He's begun this good work in me. He will bring it to completion. I think a lot of times we get in our way by trying to get in his way by trying to finish the good work that he's doing. All right, God, I got it from here. I'll take the ball. I'll run these next ten yards for you. And we start doing that, and we miss the point entirely, which is I didn't I didn't save you for you to go run away from me. I saved you to unite yourself to me. Now walk out the things and trust me. It's usually only one or two things that he's saying trust me in. And you're given light in that in a specific situation. And God says, look, you, you've dealt with this maybe with fear before or with some other way, but here, you can trust me in this. Go and ask your sister-in-law for forgiveness. Well, how can I do that? No. All right, here's another way. Okay, you, you've, not, you've not trusted me with your money for 39 years. Now start sowing into this, and you can trust me with this. You can trust me. I, I've given it to you anyway. There's, there's, there's so many multiple ways that we, could, that we could look at this. But the whole thing boils down to us believing Jesus Christ. That word believing means to place our confidence in. As I place my confidence in this stool, I'm resting in it. I'm actively at rest in this stool. As I place my confidence in what Christ says I am and who he says I am, I begin to walk out who he says I am. And the patterns, which was in the next verse, the patterns of the world that I've continued walking out for so long, I, I get to now start to learn and trust Christ in those. And I may have been walking you know, in a whole wrong way, trusting others, trusting myself, instead of trusting Christ. He confronts those things and says, no, you can trust me. You can trust me in this. And it doesn't seem that big until something big happens. Until maybe you're slapped with a lawsuit. Until maybe you lose your job. You know, when you, things are going beat by beat and you've got things under control, you may be juggling all the plates, but you got them under control, you know, it's like, yep, trust in the Lord. But then when our structure gets shaken a little bit, can we still trust Him in that? Can we still place our confidence? If not, then we're building it on sand, the sand of circumstances, instead of the rock of who Christ is. So God, you've got me in this. Uh, I, I, I never remember the acronym for fear, but I had a different acronym come out of my, of the way I thought about it anyway. It's, it's false expectations appearing real, but I like of another reality. Because when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that the truth will set you free. The other word for truth is reality. So it's false expectations of another reality. It's Jesus not in there with me. Okay? When I have to go to court, is Jesus going to be in court with me? Yeah. Is he ever going to leave me or forsake me? No. Okay. Can I trust that? And that's a breath-by-breath breath trust. I know it personally from going through it. That's not a, yeah, I'll trust Jesus tomorrow on it. That's, <gasps> I just got scared again, Lord. I'm, just, uh, I'm a sheep. I'm just running away from you. I think I've got to handle this on my own. He says, no, no, no. Come back here. Come back here. When you lose your job, can you have, can you, can you worship God in the same manner? Or is your circumstances shaking you? When those things shake you, those are actually symptoms of something that God wants to show you. I want to heal you of that. They're not bad. So many times we look at the symptoms of being scared and think, oh, I failed again. I'm so bad. Or the symptom of something that comes along and we, we get down on ourselves. 
All they are is a symptom. A, a, a nurse practitioner would not, if you had uh, bumps on your arm and you had a symptom of, say, measles in your body, would not come, and you wouldn't have to come to her and say, well, I feel guilty, I got measles. She'd say, no, no, that's a symptom that there's a disease inside you that needs healing. Well, the symptoms of, of, of anxiety and of fear, and we can go through a ton of them, are symptoms that show you an area that God wants to heal you in, an area that he wants to bring his rest and freedom in. Don't, don't run away from those things. And that's why we have to be a true faith church here to share in those things, to remind each other of the real things that we're dealing with because I can come alongside you and, and, and start to remind you of the reality because false expectations of another reality. I can remind you of the reality that you know, even though you lost your job, Christ will be there with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. You don't have to deal with this on your own. He's going to open up opportunities that you get to walk in. Now you rest in that. And at the time you're unemployed to the time you get a job, that same peace is right there. The same rest is there. The darts will come to say, oh, you can't trust this God. You can't trust this God. But the reality is, I can. I just get skittish and I get scared. And I need one another during those times to help to lift me up. Just like Moses needed... Uh, Aaron and Ben, Ben, no, no, her. I always think Ben, her, but it was Aaron and her as they were fighting in the Old Testament. And, and every time that they were fighting, or not every time, but in this one specific time when Moses had his hands up, the Israelites were winning. And, and he couldn't keep his arms up. So, Aaron, uh, so Moses enlisted Aaron and her to come alongside him to help prop his arms up. Guys, we're the same way. We need one another. And we have the beauty of the body of Christ getting to minister in those ways one to another. And I get to experience the spiritual giftings of being an encouragement or somebody showing you the truth. But guess what? It's not just me that gets to do that. It's one another in here. When I get weak and when I lose confidence in Christ and I'm getting battered by the fiery darts, I need you guys to do the same thing for me. It's not the hierarchy. If we need one another. The only way that can happen is if I allow you into my life and allow you to see the good, yeah, and we, we praise the good, but the bad and the ugly too. And you get to walk through that with me. And sometimes walking through it is, uh, I, I remember Jackie saying, I, I just don't know how to walk with this uh, young girl, this, this teenager, and, and what I don't have any answers for. And I said, I don't either. I said, I've got one. Love never fails. Be patient and kind. And we started talking about what love looks like. And it didn't fail. We were trying to come up with the right answer to get her out of her situation. But really the right answer was love in that. And in my weakness, he becomes strong. And see, that's the beauty of it. The weaker I am, the more that his strength gets to, gets to be realized in me and through me. And so we get to lift one another up out of those things. All right, so he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, another thing that will, will help you in seeing this is, in the original language, it says, to present your bodies. This one, in the, in the uh, ESV, it says, as a. In the KJV, it doesn't have that word, as. Either as or a is not in there either way. But present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. See, it's a condition that you already are. Instead of trying to become... It's a condition that you are. Present your bodies. It's a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. The other way around is, all right, now you make yourself holy, acceptable, and acceptable to God, and then present yourself as a living sacrifice. No, because the, the, the bar will just keep getting further down the road. No, you're really not holy enough. Well, you're really not acceptable enough. And the lie. And it was, like, as Watchman Nee said, the folly of man trying to enter a room he's already in. See, we already are holy and acceptable to God. If we don't know that, then we don't realize what, what chapter 6 said. We don't realize what chapter 5 said by the finished work of Christ. It's not by our work, it's by His work that we are that. So He's saying, now present your body. It's a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. If we just change the as to it, it would change everything. Either way, that word isn't in there. So present your bodies a living sacrifice, it's a description of what your body now is because of his finished work. But there is a presenting here. And sometimes that, 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 that pendulum swings too far. And Oh, well, God's already done it all. I can just sit here. Uh, I was talking to a brother about this about a week or two ago. And 
he's, he was a little bit upset at how a lot of people will take what this beautiful grace of God is and then they, they get into the ditch of passivity. Sometimes we get into that ditch of passivity or we get into the ditch of legalism. Then it's neither. So here we're instructed to present ourselves to God. Think about what he said earlier in the uh, chapter where he said, talking about presenting yourself. This is where you get the word acting. Or it's not even the word obedience because sometimes we mix those things up. Obedience means to listen under or to hearken attentively. Out of our hearkening attentively and listening to God, we then act upon what he has said. So here's the acting out verse. He says, now do not present your members or not act like uh, your, no, do not act in the way of sinful as instruments for unrighteousness, but act, uh, let me just read it in the regular, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Notice the tense, that's why I underlined it in there. You're not bringing yourself from death to life, you couldn't do it if you tried. You have been. You say now, you present yourselves as ones that have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Righteousness is the behavior that comes out of godliness. Godliness is a connection, a living in communion with your God. That's why it says train in godliness. Because we have to train in godliness. I've been very well trained in ungodliness. I've been trained in living without God. Now I get to train in living with God. And out of that becomes righteous behavior. Becomes behavior. Why is it righteous? Because of how good I am? No, because of how good Christ has made me, because he himself lives in me. If it comes about me, then pride starts to step back in, and God says, you didn't do it in the first place, Dave. Why do you think you did it? Why do you, you don't, no, no, it's me in you that does this. Now you present yourselves as one that's been brought from death to life. It says sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under law, but under grace. Grace, God's divine influence over my heart and soul, as I live under that divine influence over my heart and soul and present myself as an instrument for God, there's this beautiful circle of life, of Zoe life, this river of life that begins to take place where the mercies of God, the love of God begins to flow through me. It never originated with me to begin with. But there is a point where we have to act upon what God has stewarded us uh, uh, over. See, that's it. All of it comes from God. We become stewards of what God has given us. And let's look at the last part of the verse. <clears throat> Let me just read the whole thing again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's, that's, I don't know where they got with this spiritual worship part. And, and I'm not knocking the ESV. I love it and I use it for the most part. But there's no other version that puts it this way. Pretty much everyone says this is your reasonable service. A lot of, some of them will even say this is the logical ends to it. Which, because the word there is, uh, is logos when it's using uh, reasonable. It's talking about logic. It's coming out of the word logos, which just means this is a logical end. This is a conclusion to something that seems so logical. This is who he's made you to be. Now I'm coming alongside you. You now present this beautiful body that Christ has made in you and through you. Now, that's a very reasonable service. It's, um, I think of what 1 Peter 2.9 says on this one, too. It says, you're a chosen... Because I asked myself, well, why service there? Because you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Do you notice that you may proclaim the excellencies of him? That's the presenting. You know, I present my mouth. I present my own body as a service to other people. That's my reasonable service. Why service? Because priests serve. And if you're part of the priesthood, then you're called to serve. You're called to, to be a part of, of this body. You're called, and body not in this place right here, but body in, in, in the church in general. You're called to serve because that's what Christ came. He said, I didn't come to, to be served, but I came to serve. And if His very nature lives inside you, then that same heart of God raises right up with you. I, I like what Ephesians 2.10 says on this verse, on something very similar. It says, we're His workmanship. 
That's his poema, his beautiful poem, his, his created by what God had breathed out. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I mean, does your heart rise up? I think it does for the people in here. Does your heart rise up at the opportunity to be used by Him? Do you think about it? Do you desire it? Maybe it's not coming to fruition yet, and maybe it's not the season, or God brings these little things in each one, each little drop begins to, to be poured out. And we don't know how it all goes together. But God is, is bringing these good works. Does your heart rise up towards this? I think, I think for most people that know Christ and know the union of who they are, it does. It's not a chore that they have to do. And if, if that's kind of your heart, I have to go out and do this for God, then you miss the boat. It's really I get to do this from God. And I get to now experience Christ living in me. I get to now experience what this looks like out into the world. See, we're priests. We're the ones that minister the light and life of Christ to the world. It's what we get to do. It's out of our no <clears throat> it's out of our new nature. It's what we want to do. It's our greatest delight. The other things become things like um, that we do just so that we can live, but we live so that we can minister this light and life out into the gospel of uh, gospel into the world. And it changes everything. It changes the way that you view others. It changes the way that you view your own life and the stewardship. Because your life is only a breath anyways. And God's given you that. You're the steward over your own life. But he said, I made you this way so that you can bring my light and life to people. Bring my light and life to, to the hurting and to the lost. Bring my light and life to those family members that have been rebelling against me. And they may look good on the outside, but they're, they're desperately uh, in need of me on the inside. It's what we get to do. It's our pleasure that we get to share this glad message of a happy God. We, we leave the rest to God. It's not up for you to change anyone. You can't change yourself. Don't try to change others. But you can present the reality of who Christ is in them. You can present the reality of who they can be in Christ. You can present the reality of the finished work of Jesus Christ and call them to your side and say, Come alongside me. I, wanna, I want you to live in this life that I have. I think of, of Suhad and a few other people that I know that when he talks of living this life, other Christians will say, other Christians will say, oh, you're bragging. No, he's not bragging about himself. He's bragging about this God that lives inside him that he gets to do these things. And it almost comes across as arrogant because they're so upset. Well, why am I not living that kind of life? Why does my life not look like joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness? Well, maybe there's a symptom. Maybe there's something I can come alongside you. But if they're prideful and they're ready to hurl stones, then they'll never accept the words that you're going to give them. In fact, God is resisting them in that condition because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So it's not a, it's not a prideful thing. I think sometimes we need to, to learn how to say these things right, and I'm as guilty as anybody else on this. But it, it's not a pride in, in ourselves because the origination never came from us to begin with. Our, our, each cell in our body never came from us. We were born by God, born of God, of Christ in us, now to share this beautiful message, this glad message of God. When I come to that point, I, I, it's as if I'm sharing not only myself, but who Christ has made me to be as an offering. That's service. That's presenting yourself. That's what it means to present yourself. Now here's the beauty that God does in, in, in the body of Christ. Each of us have been given gifts and talents, and we're stewards of those gifts and talents. Now, each of those gifts and talents connects. It's kind of like tendons and ligaments. You don't, wouldn't want your whole body to be full of tendons. I mean, you need ligaments connect, connecting bone to bone. Tendons connect muscle to, to bone. Right? So not all of us have to be, can be the same. But as we, this, this body begins to be built up, we can now see the beauty of each other's gifts. And we can, we can say, man, I loved your gift of encouragement uh, my, to my brother Tony over there. I needed him on Friday. And I went and chatted with him. I needed him. But you know what? He needs me. And I come alongside with the gifts and talents that God has given me. And yet there's this union that starts to come. There's, there's, there's this beautiful relationship that begins to, to continue to, to open up and to flower 
And the reason it does is because they're com complementative of one another. They complete one another. And there is that way in this whole entire body. When we, are, when we start completing one another instead of competing against one another, then the beauty of Christ is raised up and people will look on and say, well, I don't know a whole lot about what they believe, but they sure do love each other. They sacrificially love each other. If we can do that in one body, and we can start doing that as bodies interconnected with other churches, that's when the world will look on, as it says in John 17, 23, and know that, that this is of God by the love that we have for one another and the union that we have with one another. Now, I pray as we going to go into some worship time that we can start to live out of who we are. Truly and completely. I, I, I don't want to be like, like Suhad is. Suhad is, and, and no, it's not to throw Suhad under the bus, the gifts and talents that Suhad has been stewarded over, when I start to say, God, you've created me in this way, but I want to be more like Suhad, I'm not pointing my finger at Suhad, I'm pointing my finger at God and saying, you didn't make me good enough to, to be who I am. I need to be more like some, another man. No, God says, you need to be who you are with the gifts and talents I've given you right today. I'll start to, to help you to walk those gifts and talents out. I'll complete this finished work in you as you look to me and as you walk with me. And now, we each know that. And we each get to walk in that one with another, holding each other's arms up when we're weak. And, and sometimes you'll be the ones that, that need the help to hold your arms up. Sometimes you'll be the one under there holding somebody's arms up. And there's, there's real love and unity that comes in that. And I'm love, the greatest love, greatest love. Oh, I've been set free. I've been